So since we've been having these conversations, this is our third conversation that we've had, inventory levels have dropped 100%. 100%, right, which is crazy. So even since we chatted last, inventory levels have dropped like 30 to 40%. So things are like flying off the shelves. Look, this is, for anybody that's watching this video, this is an indicator of what we can expect. Like I would probably say six to eight weeks out from a pricing perspective. But if this number continues to stay this low, this is an indicator of supply and demand. If this is a very low number, we expect that prices will continue to increase because there's a an immense amount of demand out there. That's exactly what this number means. What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here and we're back with Emma Pace from Toronto and we're diving deep into the GTA real estate market data. So we're actually gonna really nerd out in this video. I hope you guys enjoy it. If you'd like to see us continue to dive deep into the numbers and stats the way we do in this video, let us know in that comment section down below. If you guys wanna get in contact with Emma, her contact information's in the video description down below and let's just jump into it. What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here. We've got our local expert for Toronto, Emma Pace, with us today. Hey Emma, how's it going? Hey, I'm doing well, Matt, how are you? Doing well myself. And I'm really excited to talk about the Toronto real estate market, every real estate market in uh, Canada, Ontario specifically right now, seems to be on fire. I know that the last time we touched in, there was some developments in the condo market where it was really swinging the momentum. So excited to kind of hear what's going on in your world, what's going on in your market. But I guess before we jump into the presentation, any general perspective you want to share? Um, I think we've been on track for what our expectations have been kind of month over month. So, um, you know, these last 30 days, I think since we spoke last is, uh, there's been some gasoline on the market, that's for sure. So, um, it's, it's interesting to see us do this every month and to revert back and, and, um, get a better understanding of where we were 30 days ago and what our expectations are. Um, and I'm curious to see if our uh, predictions month over month will continue to be correct. And uh, so far they, they have. All right. Well, I'm excited to jump into the data. So I'm going to pull up your uh, screen share here Perfect. and uh, break it down for us. What's going on in Toronto? Yeah. So um, just to kind of go over the month over month numbers again, um, we've obviously seen some um, record breaking stuff. And I think, um, these numbers down here are going to probably continue to get more interesting as we have these conversations, um, and go, uh, month over month from when we actually, uh, saw the lockdown. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a rundown, I mean, last month we talked about detached houses and condo apartments. Um, and of course condos still look like they're down year over year and they are, but if we have a peak as to where we were last month, uh, the average price for um, both December and for January hovered around 625, if you recall. So it was, it was actually flat for the last two months. But if we look at the average pricing for February, we've actually hopped up um, to 766. So it's been, you know, 50K in terms of, uh, you know, average price growth month over month. So we've actually seen seven, you know, just over seven and a half percent month over month growth in terms of pricing. So I'm curious to see, I mean, we're here in this graph and this was obviously where the uh the lockdown happened right so i'm kind of curious to see over the next couple of months what these bottom year over year numbers are going to look like but as far as things are trending right now in all asset in all asset classes condos condo town semis and detached we're up just shy of double digits for each category um so Condo towns, semis, and detached properties are all up $100,000 month over month at this point in time. And condo pricing is up about 50K month over month. Crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, like again, you know, the data really does tell the story though, right? So I imagine as we get further into it, we're gonna see inventory, is, we're still not flooded with inventory and that's probably one of the big drivers. Definitely, I, I agree with you. So just so you know, all the viewers have kind of an understanding that I'm not BSing you, here are the numbers from uh, last month, right? So if you see we were at 1.58, 1.2, 719, and 625, and if we revert back here, we're at 1.68, 1.32, 817, and 676. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, looking on a month over month perspective, it's, uh, yeah, it's getting, it's getting pretty hectic out here. Obviously tons of bidding wars, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm, I am curious as we continue to move forward into these month over, or sorry, these year over year numbers, 
what these are going to start looking like because uh, these numbers we can expect to jump quite a bit uh, yeah. the, the next couple of months. Maybe not when the March numbers get released, but I think the most – you know, the, the biggest shocking change will probably be as soon as we start seeing April and May roll over if the current trends continue in the spring market. Um, mm -hmm. These are going to start looking pretty crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So uh, as we kind of continue on here, I think the one thing that I really, like the, the one point that I really do want to hammer home is unless you purchase between mid-Jan and mid-March, 2020. So basically right before the lockdown, we've averaged out from a pricing perspective again. So the only people who may potentially be behind on their condo purchase right now are the people who literally bought within this two month span last year. Everybody okay. else is ahead right now. Okay. Or at least even. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if condo trends continue on the same, you know, on the same trajectory, I mean, in theory, we could probably close that gap in a month or two. Right. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens over the next couple of months. Um, but yeah, the only people who are potentially behind is literally just this particular sector of Jan to mid March, 2020. Buyers. Yeah. That's interesting. I appreciate you breaking that out for us. Yeah. So one thing that I do want to talk about, and we've talked about this every month so far, Matt, is the detached price, the condo price ratio. And so what I was able to do is actually found this old graph. It's like history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And yeah. I have this gut feeling. I'm like, this feels to me exactly like 2017. Um, in 2017 was called like the, you know, uh, unofficial year of the condo, right? Like that was really when we saw the biggest condo boom in terms of pricing. And I think what's, what's really interesting is the, over the last 20 years, the average between you know, detached pricing in condos is two. So if you were to buy a condo for 500 grand, the average detached price would be a million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. um, what we noticed is that Q4 2016 to Q2 2017, we started to trend above that 2.2 ratio, right? And so right now we're sitting at 2.48, which is drastically higher. Like last month we were at 2.35 and the month before that we were at about 2.2. So mm -hmm. that, that gap, even though condos are, are creeping up, the detached prices are still leaving them a pretty big runway to kind of catch up at this point in time, okay? Yeah, so, that, that's really interesting that it's outpacing. It, yeah, it is. I mean, like, look at these numbers, right? I mean, condos and detached prices, condos this past month outbeat them slightly, mm -hmm. but uh, we still have a while to catch up based on what kind of happened last year, right? So if we look at this graph here like because because I feel like it's 2017 I'm also trying to go back and, and say okay what like, does this look like 2017 as well like, it mm -hmm. feels like it but does it look like it and when I look at these graphs over the five-year history if we see the sh like the sharpest slope upward it this is very very close if we look at these two together right mm -hmm. and so this if we look at you know Q Four to um, Q2 kind of 2017, that's kind of what we're looking at again. Um, and we're starting to see that that ratio hit up here. So I'm curious to see if we're going to see that massive slope continue upward here. Obviously, you know, we were kind of on that trajectory last year that we got hit with COVID, but that was a bit of a black swan event. Um, if I look back here, you'll notice that there is a bit of a dip in 2017. Like right mm -hmm. here is when they introduced the um, non-resident speculation tax, right? So there was some government intervention as to why there was a little bit of regression in terms of pricing here. And so mm -hmm. um, I don't think if that tax came in, because uh, you'll notice here on this graph, this gap closes very quickly, right? Like this is when they this is when they introduced that uh, non-resident speculation tax. So it closes very quickly because we started seeing a lot of houses in the GTA that were single detached properties selling for a ridiculous price because there were lots of vacant homes and stuff like that, Markham, Vaughn, all of those kind of areas. So we saw this gap close very quickly, but that was government intervention. Gotcha. Yeah. Really appreciate you breaking this down, Emma. This is very thorough and um, very insightful. Uh, yeah, no worries. Honestly, this is 
you know, like I said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And I think it's really important to understand, um, you know, it does seem crazy with what's happening right now, but we need to understand why did things happen over the past five years. And the only time that we've seen a market slow down is because of one government intervention with that tax or two, this black swan event with COVID, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, are we going to get some form of government intervention to kind of slow this down? I'm, I'm not sure, right? But next, going to kind of your point, um, and this is also just very interesting too, of the last five years, the only slope that we've actually seen downwards um, for active listings going into spring market is this year and 2017. Every other year you've started to see active listings increase, but there's so much market activity right yeah. now that active listings is, is drastically decreasing, right? And so that kind of brings us to, um, before we go there, just one last thing. I think this graph is probably gonna look the craziest when, uh, over the next couple months, because I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing triple digits here. Um, these are, just so everybody knows, this is the total number of sales that are occurring. This has nothing to do with like prices. This has not, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, refers to actual trades that are happening. So we're up very, uh, you know, very drastically over last year at this time. But the peak of the lockdown, there was nothing happening because no one had any idea. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, there wasn't very much consumer confidence at that point in time. So if we continue to roll forward, over the next couple months with what we've seen to see triple digits here. I honestly, I wouldn't be surprised. What about you? Yeah, it, it seems plausible. Um, and again, while this doesn't necessarily, necessarily directly reflect prices, obviously as volume increases, um, normally what we see in real estate, that that's going to start really establishing new floors for pricing, which again, starts to lead to higher prices as it drifts up. So, yeah. um, yeah, it, it's really interesting. I know that th there's a lot of people that want to naturally react and feel like we're in a bubble right now, just because when you look at some of these stats year over year, and especially over the next couple of months, as you say, it's going to look even more drastic. Yeah. But I think the key is to focus on this data, right? When we're seeing really high volume of transactions at this price point, it's important to understand like some of the same basic principles that people that like trade in stocks or other financial instruments or assets, you know, there's a reason that that starts to establish a new floor, right? As we see that volume activity increase. So it, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how the next few months shape up. Yeah. I feel like these conversations over the next couple of months are going to be very, very, very interesting because the numbers are going to look even juicier, but we'll kind of see, we'll see what happens. So, Going on to the point of months of inventory, like I think you and I both agree that this is probably the number one metric that we need to be looking for. This is almost like a leading indicator yeah. of what we can expect for at least the next couple of weeks, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think what's super interesting is like you and I started having these conversations, Matt, in and around kind of like right here, right? Where we were hovering around two. Yeah. So since we've been having these conversations, this is our third conversation that we've had, inventory levels have dropped 100%. 100%, right? Which is crazy. So even since we chatted last, inventory levels have dropped like 30 to 40%. So things are like flying off the shelves, right? And so this, this metric takes into account if there was no new inventory that hit the market today, how long would it take for everything that's on the market to kind of get consumed based on um, you know, how many listings are out there, how quickly listings are hitting the market, and then like how quickly they're being kind of eaten up off the market. So there really is not much. For us to see kind of a balanced market, it would be, a, you know, a number of four months of inventory. And so what I did was I grabbed this graph up here. Thanks again, Scott Ingram, I love you. Like, you're the best. <laughs> um, but he broke it down by asset class up here in regards to total months of inventory per to see one sub one for everything, every single asset class is crazy. This means that we're in a, an extreme seller, mm -hmm. like an extreme seller's market at this point in time. So um, this means that the demand for each of these asset classes is extremely high. Yeah, it, it's shocking to see something like inventory tighten up, like to that fifty percent drop in a few months, like. Again, if we think about any other asset class, what that would naturally do to it, right? It just restricts. And if demand stays high, it's naturally going to drive prices higher. So it's really interesting to see the context that even just like, 
you know, since what, like November, right? Like, yeah, I that's mean, such well, a dramatic shift from like four times month, like four months worth of inventory to less than one month. Like that, if if there is still people that have been on the sidelines, again, like we usually see them come into the market in the spring. Yeah. Um, it'll be really interesting to see how this shapes up. I'm, I'm curious to see how it goes because I'm like, can this number get any lower? It, it, it seems crazy to me. Um, we're getting well, pretty close. If it summer. gets much lower, what does that do to pricing, right? Like do people really start to have weird reactions and do they start to really have weird emotional, you know, behaviors start to occur because of the fact that they're so caught up in yeah. the idea that like, I may never be able to buy one or what if this is the new normal? Cause like, the moment you're less than one month's inventory consistently for any period of time, like I think weird distortions can happen in the market. So yeah, I agree with you. I mean, look, this is for anybody that's watching this video, this is an indicator of what we can expect. Like I would probably say six to eight weeks out from a pricing perspective, right? Because we're going to continue to track this every week. But if this number continues to stay this low, this is an indicator of supply and demand. If this is a very low number, we expect that prices will continue to increase because there's a, an immense amount of demand out there. That's exactly what this number means. And so in, in my opinion, yes, it's really, really important to understand what's happening with prices month over month. But if you want the metric that is going to give you an indicator of what's going to happen for the next couple of weeks, in my opinion, this is the one that you should be looking at because it really is a finger on the pulse of what's happening this particular week. So you should track this graph. I track it every single week to see what's going on. And in my opinion, I thought this was probably the bottom of the market when we had this much inventory. And obviously as we continue to add more data points to this graph, I think it's kind of proving that it probably was. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Love this data. Yeah, this is, this is, this is critical. If you're in the market, this is critical information to know. Um, I think, uh, one thing I just want to give a shout out to Jordan at Pre-Condo. Um, he had pulled this graph, and I think it's a really, really important graph for people to know. So this is um, the change in average resale pricing for um, from Q1 2020 to Q3, which is probably when we hit kind of the bottom of the market, for price per square foot, depending on how, how many stories we're in a building. Okay? Mm. So I think this is a great graph for end users. Like this gives me a really good idea of what type of buyer someone might be. Um, so if we look here, anything that was under kind of 20 stories, so uh, in, in Toronto that would be considered like a boutique style tower, right? Um, these boutique style towers are very highly in demand. Oftentimes they might be hard lofts or you know uh, loft conversion type of properties, that kind of thing, right? What we typically find in Toronto is if we're in boutique buildings, the rental to owner ratio is significantly less, okay? In these style, like we'll say massive condo towers down in City Place or ICE condos where there's a lot of uh, like Airbnbs and stuff, we'll usually find that the rental to owner ratio is, it might be 60% renters. 50% renters, that kind of thing, right? Like to see on over 50% spread of owners to renters is not uncommon when we start to get into these higher high rise buildings. But down here, when we start to get into more boutique style buildings, they actually were not affected really by the COVID market because they're so highly in demand and there's, there's very few of them out there. The important thing to understand is like, they command an extreme premium to enter, but they will also command a premium when you go to, to, re, to resell them, right? Um, so these type of properties, you're, you know, people are paying 13, 1500 bucks a square foot to get in a boutique condo like this because there's not very many of them that exist. But I think this is a really important graph to understand if you are gonna buy in a bigger condo, we can expect a lower price per square foot in a higher, rise building. So they might be easier for end users to get in or investors to get in from a um, entry level price perspective, but there is more volatility of, you know, other people or investors who just want to cash out. Right. Um, mm -hmm. 
So I think this is really important. This gives me a very good indicator when I talk to people about this kind of thing, like what type of buyer are you? Are you willing to pay a premium to get into a top quality building? Or are you someone who's like, I just need to get on the property ladder? We might need to focus more on this because the, the entry level price per square foot will be lower. Yeah, th like this makes a lot of sense when you say it, but I'd never really thought about it before. So uh, yeah, I think this is particularly useful for anyone like me that's maybe new to the idea. So uh, yeah, I really appreciate you bringing this yeah. up. One thing, you know, for anybody who's watching this video that's contemplating purchasing a condo, look, when you see this graph, everyone's like, oh, well, I might as well just go with a boutique building, right? Um, that said, like I, like I said before, you're going to be paying 1300 bucks, 1500 bucks a square foot to get into these buildings. One thing that you do need to keep in mind is um, you're only splitting the repair costs on these towers from a maintenance fees perspective with 50 to 200 people. Here you might be splitting it with 2,000 people and it's one roof, right? So understand the key element here. Yeah, you're going to pay a premium, but you need to do your due diligence on management and how the reserve fund is being allocated because um, you could get into hot water from a carrying cost perspective if a massive repair does come up in these type of towers because you don't have as many people to split those costs with. Yeah, great point. Cool. Um, okay, so I know we want to talk about deals. Yeah. Really. Okay, so one thing that I wanted to go over just to kind of highlight what's actually been happening. Um, mm -hmm. The good thing with condos is it's very easy to find comparables uh, because normally the people who are stacked on top of each other or potentially side by side are like a mirror image, right? Yeah. Um, so this particular condo, these are side by side units, just flipped layouts basically, okay? Okay. Uh, this particular one is unit 711. This sold January 12th, 2021 for 655, okay? This guy is unit 710. It's next door neighbor that sold February uh, 24th, so literally a month and a half after, for 710. Okay? Um, so I think these guys are about you know 737 square feet. We're still able to get slightly less than a thousand bucks a square foot in certain neighborhoods downtown. But in January, this guy bought for like high 800s a square foot. And now we're paying high 900s square foot so it's important to understand like this is happening month over month mm -hmm. you can't reject what's happening in the market if you want to enter the market you need to embrace it it sucks if you've been looking since last year and you have these expectations that like you know the market hasn't rebounded as a result of the you know influence of covid it has and this is exactly why i wanted to show side by side neighboring properties we're talking a month and a half for um you know sixty thousand bucks in gains Mm -hmm. Awesome, so, yeah, I really appreciate you breaking this down. Yeah. So I wanted to do a quick, so I took this exact deal. I want to preface this by saying like the numbers that I'm about to break down for you and by no means do I think this is a good deal, okay? I don't think it's a good deal. I just wanted to um, preface and kind of show all of your viewers what a difference interest rates can make on the overall yeah. return because we've obviously seen rental prices come down in the con market pretty drastically okay so uh, for anybody that's out there this isn't a good deal this is just for example purposes we could find you much better deals than this but just so you understand if I was to pick any deal off a shelf this is what kind of the numbers look like okay so using this this guy here yeah in 2020 if you paid this 655 and you put 20% down you have 131,000 for your down payment Okay. If we say that the interest, like the interest rates, was, they were probably around three percent. If we were having this conversation uh, to borrow last year for rental properties, okay. Mm -hmm. So your mortgage at that time would have been around twenty four eighty, okay. Um, and then your the maintenance fees for this particular condo are five thirty three, and the taxes would be two hundred bucks a month. Fast forward to this year, okay. Let's say the purchase price and the down payment are all the same and your fees and your taxes aren't gonna change. They're gonna stay the exact same year over year for the most part. Maybe they change slightly, but for the purposes of this example, we'll say that they stay the same. The only variable that has changed is the interest rates, which I'm assuming is um, a big factor as to kind of what's happening in the market today as well. Yeah. Okay? So if we look at this, 
the rents last year for this particular property were 2,500 bucks. Okay. This year they've gone down to 2,100. So everyone is like, Oh my God, this is ridiculous. You know, rental rates have dropped pretty drastically and they have, but if we want to look at the, the net benefit of an investor holding this property with the, you know, with the rate change, um, it's important to kind of look at this for face value because things actually haven't changed that much because rates have played in favor of investors. Contracted, yeah. Interesting. So, um, cash flow is terrible. Like, first of all, if you're buying a condo downtown for a rental, whether it was last year or this year, like don't be buying for cash flow. That's not yeah. the investors that we're typically working with. And again, this is, we could beat this by a mile, but understand, look, last year, this particular condo with these numbers would have resulted in $700 a month out of pocket. And this year we're looking at 850. So that's, that's a pretty drastic difference, right? But if you look at the, the net benefit to the investor of holding this particular property because of the amortization with the principal payment versus the interest payment, um, the net benefit, even though this is significantly higher from a cash outflow perspective on a monthly basis, you're getting a significant amount more principal paid down when the um, tenant is paying your mortgage off e each month as a result of the interest rate being low. Okay, so um, it's important to understand that the actual net benefit of holding this particular property, right, even though you're paying $800 or $700 a month out of pocket with the principal pay down that you're receiving and the principal recapture of your mortgage, the, an investor is making $520 net benefit each month or 509. So this looks drastically different, but we're talking about like 10 bucks a month. Yeah. Yeah. This is a really interesting example that I never would have thought of breaking out this way, Emma. So definitely yeah. appreciate you giving us this uh, context. Yeah, so I think like overall, look, this guy that bought last month, if we were to not take into account this spread yeah. that we made, okay, he, they're looking at like, you know, we'll say without looking at all the numbers for closing costs and stuff, just a very basic number. If you were mm -hmm. to invest 131,000 bucks, you're getting, you're getting just shy of a 5% return for holding the property. But you're still, you still have to make sure that you have the capacity to be able to pay out of pocket to hold this property every month until market, uh, rent, market rents rebound kind of thing. Yeah. Right? But with this guy, he invested last month, and if we take into account the one month appreciation, he's already made a 46% return on his money. Right, which is ridiculous. And I, I don't think it's sustainable, so I would yeah. never advise <laughs> anybody to look at it this way. But what I'm saying is um, if you're considering investing and you want to buy a condo downtown, it does look very doom and gloom from a numbers perspective for face value rental rates. Yeah. The great. net benefit of owning a property as a result of the rates being significantly lower today are actually almost the exact same thing as, as if you were to have purchased the property last year because you're locking in the lower rates. The good news is we're starting to see the rental market. I don't think we're going to see it rebound this year or maybe next year. I don't know. But the good news is if you have tenants that are going to turn over and we can get back here, your actual benefit of holding this property um, forecasting for the future will actually be a little bit better if you purchased today than last year based on the fact of locking in that rate for five years. Interesting. Yeah, definitely love this. This is a, a really creative way to present it to people and just kind of illustrate again that like the devil's in the details here, right? Where there's so many different variables at play that you guys need to always very, very specifically focus on the context of your situation, the exact deal you're looking at doing and exactly what resources or um, kind of levers you have available to pull. Yeah, it's just important to understand, look, prices are increasing. At some point in time, we're going to see the rental rates in increase as well, of course. If you're an investor that's sitting on the sideline waiting for rental rates to rebound, you might not be in any better of a position by waiting for the rates to go up um, as a result of you know potential interest rate increases. And um, yeah. so, you know, borrowing... In borrowing debt right now is not a terrible idea if you can if you have the financial wherewithal to um, 
you know, to, to substantiate what you're borrowing, um, understanding that it might be a one, two year turnaround time to kind of get back to where we, we were, if you can kind of, you know, float that for yourself. That doesn't mean that that's the right thing for everybody. And again, this is not a good deal. We can find way better deals than this. This is just to give you an you know, exact understanding of this particular off the shelf type of deal. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think other than that, like just wanted to highlight oh, one of our team members had this listing last week. It's a one bedroom condo in Liberty Village. Okay, it was just over 600 square feet. Did have a sick terrace, I'm not gonna lie. 50 offers on this thing. Oh wow. 50 offers, okay. Um, logistically, an absolute nightmare to, <laughs> uh, to coordinate. But we're talking a one bedroom condo that's sold for 760. Mm -hmm. Five months ago, I could have got you a two bed, two bath condo for this price. So um, it's just, just an interesting deal that kind of came across my desk that I was like, I wasn't expecting that, but these are some kind of outlier deals that are happening in the market as of right now, okay? So again, just to kind of reiterate and wrap up here, yeah. um, strategies, I think the strategies to be successful in today's market are the exact same strategies that I recommended um, last month. So be there on the first day of showings, okay? Bully offers, extremely effective tool, okay? Um, know your audience. So if it's an investor, make sure that you're positioning yourself. Don't just send your offer in and not give any context around who you are. I've got two deals in the last 15 days because of writing cover letters. So we might say that's all BS in today's market. No one's going to care, but people still do care, right? It's, it might not win you the deal, but it'll at least help you level up your game a little bit. So I 100% strongly recommend doing that even in today's market, like help yourself as much as you possibly can. Okay. Um, and I think, yeah, just being prepared and understanding that these statistics is extremely important. You, you have to know what's going on in the market and you have to be realistic. You can't reject this information. You have to learn to embrace it, even if it isn't something that you want to. It's just a sad reality of what's happening. And if you want to be successful in today's market, this is, this is what you need to do. And this is what you need to understand. Awesome. Yeah. Really appreciate you breaking it down and managing expectations for people. Uh, this was a wealth of knowledge. It's always Emma. So I really appreciate it. And just a reminder for everyone watching this down in the video description down below, you can grab a link to all of Emma's contact information, follow along with her on social media. And just kind of as we're wrapping up here, any other last words of advice for the audience looking in the GTA market? Or again, if they're sitting on the sidelines, it doesn't really hurt to start a conversation. Yeah, look, I think what's really important for people to understand is that this process, if you're a purchaser, is about a four to five month process, okay? So to just think that you're gonna pick up tomorrow and move into a house next month is probably something that's not realistic. So if you're thinking about buying, and you want to move in in fall of 2021, like start the process now. This is going to take you a little bit of time and you need to prepare yourself. Um, this isn't something that really happens overnight. You do need to give yourself some time to prepare. So if you're thinking about moving in fall, like you need to start working on it now. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it's your first time, like you almost never get the first property you look at, like you're going to be too conservative or too scared or too whatever. Um, so it is important that you kind of cut your teeth and get into the market a little earlier, start learning, start following along with the data, follow along with Emma on social media. Again, really appreciate Emma, you're always a wealth of information. Awesome, thanks man. I have one, actually, actually one last thing that I wanted, just a tip that just came to mind. Um, one thing that's really important in the condo market is that, or any market these days, the, the seller may have not purchased another property at this point in time. So one thing that's been extremely effective in our offers over the last 30 days is putting in a sliding closing for them to give mm -hmm. them the flexibility to close when they want, you know, 30 days before or 30 days after. A lot of purchasers will not provide that flexibility. And I know that's the, there's no dollar value to that, but that could be a make or break it thing. If you're in the top three and you can provide that to a seller, there is a tremendous amount of value in today's market to adding that to your offer. So I would, I would totally recommend that for anybody that's on this call. 
Yeah, that's a huge tip, and I could see that being a very powerful one-two combo with a cover letter plus that sliding um, closing date. That feels very personal, very focused on me as the seller, and that sounds like someone that you'd like to do business with. Totally. So use those strategies, and uh, all I can say is best of luck out there. Uh, you gotta you gotta grind it out. You gotta take a couple on the chin, but uh, you will find something if you've got the um, if you've got the the guts to do it. You know what I mean? Awesome. Thanks, Emma. Well, thanks, Matt. Thanks again to Emma for taking the time to shoot this video. Really do appreciate it. And I love the fact that she comes so prepared with all this data for us just to dive into. Let us know, were there any standout moments in this video or any standout stats that you'd like to make sure that we cover in every future video or maybe we should discuss further? Let us know in that comment section. Reminder, all of Emma's contact information is in that video description down below. Really encourage you guys to reach out to her as well as all our other realtor sponsors for whatever you know, local real estate market you're looking to invest in. And we'll see you guys in the next video.